Thanks, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in 2 Timothy. We began it last week. It's a book intended to give encouragement to Timothy and some admonition, and we come to that in verse 8 through verse 14. Paul has told him to kindle afresh the gift that God had given him. And now he says in verse 8, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed And I am convinced that he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Retain the sound, the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of studying it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. It is a great privilege. Alexamenos was a Christian who lived around A.D. 200. All that's known of him is that he suffered for his faith. And that's known because of a graffito found near the Roman Forum. It's a picture scratched in plaster of a man standing in prayer before a cross. On the cross is a crucified man with the head of a donkey. And the words, Alexanamos, Alexamenos, worships his God. Alexamenos was publicly ridiculed for his faith. I call that suffering because one of the greatest fears people have, all people, is being mocked, ridiculed. In fact, psychologists have a word for that, geliophobia, from the Greek word galao, to laugh. It means fear of laughter or fear of being laughed at. It seems that Timothy had a touch of geliophobia Because Paul tells him, do not be ashamed of the Lord or of me. That's the lesson of our passage, 2 Timothy 1, verses 8 through 14. Be not ashamed. Timothy was wavering. So Paul told him in verse 6, kindle afresh the gift God had given him and encouraged him to do that by reminding him that he had the Holy Spirit who gives power, not fear. In verses 8 through 14, Paul continues to press Timothy not to sit on the sidelines. Not in those dark days when his help was so desperately needed, but to stand with him, even suffer with him. And he begins his plea with a strong exhortation, telling him, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, meaning the testimony about the Lord, the gospel. Even though he was young, sickly, and shy, because he had the spirit of power, not fear, Timothy should never weaken in his resolve or be ashamed of the gospel. And Paul adds, or of me. Paul was in chains and condemned. That was an embarrassment for some former friends. In fact, he will say 
later in the chapter that many of them in Asia had abandoned him. The world already thought they were fools for following Christ, a, a carpenter who had been crucified as a common criminal, what kind of Messiah or king is that? Now their apostle was in jail. The shame of it all was hard to take. It was hard for Timothy as well. He had not deserted Paul, but as loyal friends melted away, he felt more alone and less courageous. So Paul tells him not to give in to that. In fact, not only was he not to be ashamed of the gospel, he was to share in the sufferings of it. Join with me in doing that, Paul says. Now that tells us something about the Christian life. It's not an easygoing life. It involves being a witness to the truth of the gospel and, and being that at some expense, at the expense of rejection and even ridicule. And if we live as lights in this world, we can expect that. Now, I say as lights, not as firebrands, not as zealots. Being a true witness of, for, for Christ involves, involves some zeal, it involves some earnestness, but it involves being Christ-like in our witness, being patient, being kind. Paul indicates that le letter, uh, later in verse 13. It involves love and discipline, Paul says in verse 7. It involves wisdom. It involves knowing what to say, when to say it, and who to say it to. It involves behavior that is consistent with the message of grace. But those who do that, who, who live like that, who live a, a, a life of love and discipline, can expect to suffer. They're giving the gospel. Still, knowing that, we're not to be quiet, we're not to be fearful, we're to be bold. And the reason is, we don't do that in our own strength. But as Paul says at the end of verse 8, according to the power of God, and that power of God is infinite power. Paul illustrates that power in verses 9 and 10. The God who gives power is the God who has saved us. And if He can save us from our sins, from the penalty of our sins, from the power of our sins, and certainly He can sustain us in suffering. So, Paul shows the greatness of God's power by showing the greatness of our salvation. He describes it in three parts. First, he shows the character of salvation, what it is. According to verses 9 and 10, it consists of, of holiness and immortality. Second, Paul states the origin of it, where it, it comes from, and it comes from God. It is according to His own purpose. He predestined our salvation from all eternity, Paul says. Thirdly, he gives the basis for it, what it is grounded on, and that is the work of Christ. It was granted us in Christ Jesus. All three of these add up really to that first statement that God has saved us. It's all the work of God. He called us. He granted us. It is all according to His purpose. Salvation is of the Lord, as Jonah put it. Now that is sovereign grace. Powerful grace. Grace that changes our lives and destiny. That's the salvation that Paul describes. And while he is describing this salvation in order to remind Timothy of the power that is for him, he also gives a good summary of the gospel and shows the wonder of God's love for Timothy. Both are incentive to serve. He begins with its nature or character. God saved us and called us with a holy calling. Salvation is more than forgiveness. It is that, importantly. It is heaven. It is immortality. 
But God not only, not only saved us from the consequences of sin, He saved us from the power of sin. He saved us from a life of sin. He saved us to a life of obedience, to a life of holiness. And so those who are saved will desire holiness. That is the, the new normal for the born again. And that is the result of our new nature. It's the result of the Spirit of God in us, His work in us, His work of sanctification. We are saved in our sin. God does not require us to make improvements before He saves us. He saves us where He finds us. He justifies the ungodly, Paul said in Romans 4 verse 5. But He doesn't leave us ungodly. He changes us. That's sanctification, which is the lifelong process whereby the Holy Spirit renews us and remakes us after the image of Christ. Justification changes our legal standing with God. Sanctification changes our moral condition. Justification removes the guilt of sin. Sanctification removes the stain of sin. Justification imputes righteousness to the sinner. Sanctification imparts righteousness to the sinner. The two are different, but they are inseparable. Let me explain it just a little more, uh, perhaps by association uh, with uh, uh, the places where we might uh, think of these as occurring. Justification, is associated, since it's a legal term, is associated with the courtroom. And so what takes place in justification is, is the same kind of situation in which a judge will pronounce a person innocent of the charges, pronounce him or her righteous in right standing with the law. And then it's as though he sounds his gavel and says, uh, not guilty, and court is adjourned. And that court never assembles again. It's finished. Once you are declared righteous by God, you are eternally in that condition. You, you can never lose that that station, that position with God. And so we associate justification with the courtroom, whereas we could associate sanctification with the clinic, where one is healed and one grows strong and one is physically um, uh, regenerated and uh, healed. That's sanctification. That is an ongoing process. We are in that process now of being strengthened in the inner man, and being made and more and more like Jesus Christ. And the result of that is, of this change that's taken place in our status, it's very important to realize we are forever righteous in the sight of God because we're connected to Christ through faith. That's our standing. But we are now being changed to be conformed to that declaration. And so as a result of what is taking place within us, the change that is occurring, we desire holiness and we will strive for it. God does not save us to a life of spiritual ease and lethargy and indolence, but to sanctification, to holiness, and the struggle against sin. No Christian, Christian can say, let us continue in sin that grace may increase. We have died to sin. We cannot be comfortable living in it. Now that is a powerful work of grace because by nature we are just the opposite. We are not holy. In fact, by nature we were dead in our sins, our transgressions and sin as Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 and 2, and we are sons of disobedience. That's, that was our nature. But those who are saved are different. They're new creatures. They're children of God with a new heart. Now that's not our doing. It's God's. It's His work. He does what is impossible for His creatures to do. He changes us. Now that could only happen by a mighty power, one that gives life to the dead. There's no greater power. And that power, Paul is indicating here and indicating to Timothy, is for us. It's for him. It's working on his behalf. 
For we are His workmanship, Paul told the Ephesians. His workmanship, not our workmanship, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So again, God is the source of our salvation. That is Paul's second point. He has called us according to His own purpose. Now, some will, someone will object to that. No, God calls people based on foreseen faith, based on deeds and effort that he, he sees. He looks down through time. He chooses those whom he sees believing, and he calls them. But our verse here in 2 Timothy makes it plain that God's calling of us has nothing to do with us, nothing to do with our merit. God has saved us and called us, note what he says here, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. That shuts out all human merit. There's no room for it. Salvation is according to God's own purpose. Can anything be plainer than that? If anyone is saved, it's not because he or she purposed to be saved but because God purposed to save him or her. Isn't that Romans 8 verse 16? It does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. We are debtors to mercy alone because he alone is the source of our salvation. Now, that troubles some people a lot, I know, that God would save men according to his own purpose and not ours. But it's what it teaches. I like what Spurgeon had to say on that point. He wrote, It's a strange thing that men should be so angry against the purpose of God. We ourselves have a purpose. We permit our fellow creatures to have some will of their own, and especially in giving away their own goods. But my God is to be bound and fettered by men and not permitted to do as He wills with His own? The problem that Spurgeon identified there is a problem that Luther recognized long ago. Men don't want to let God be God. But of course, God is God. And man cannot prevent that or bind God by man's ideas. Salvation is not man's achievement at all. It is all of God. And to leave that beyond doubt... Paul adds that it's not only according to God's purpose, but also according to His grace, which is free, not earned. And Paul says that this grace was granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity. So the the matter was settled there. The matter was settled long ago in eternity when according to God's plan, God the Father chose a people for Himself, gave them to His Son to redeem and to the Spirit to bring by faith. God planned it all. He works all things according to the counsel of His will, Ephesians 1.11. Now that's the case. That's the reality. He works all things according to the counsel of His will. Therefore, nothing can frustrate His plan or purpose. That shouldn't trouble us. It should make us grateful. God has blessed the undeserving. And that that should give us peace and quiet our fears. Because He is such a God as can deliver us from any danger. In fact, deliverance from the greatest threat has already happened. Christ has done that. He is the ground of our salvation. It's it's all based on His sacrifice for us. That's the third aspect of salvation, which Paul explains in verse 10. What God purposed in eternity, Christ accomplished in time. The grace that was given in eternity now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The gospel is the revelation of what Christ has done. Gospel, as you know, means good news. And there can be no better news than this, that Christ abolished death. 
Now you might wonder, well, how, now how is that? Because we do die. Yes, but death is, is more than a person's physical end with the separation of the soul from the body. It's also the separation of the body and soul from God forever. That's the wage of sin that Paul speaks of in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. But the grace which was granted us in Christ Jesus is realized in our deliverance from death. From spiritual death, first of all, Christ's death is the payment for our sins. This is why God can justify us, because the debts have been paid in full. And the, the obedience has been given in full, all in our Savior, our representative, our substitute. And so the spiritual death, that which separates from us from the Father, has been removed. And the result of that is eventually, someday, in His time, we'll be resurrected. And the physical death will be done away with. The, the grave will have been overcome and conquered. Now He did that for His elect. For all to whom it was granted from all eternity. One of the, the graces that God granted us in all of this is faith. Which means the elect believe. In fact, what's the evidence that one is elect? How can you know you are elect? You believe. You've trusted in Christ. You believe the gospel. That's what the elect do. So this, this message that Paul is giving here is for believers. Everyone who believes will be saved. Jew or Gentile, male, female, whoever believes will be saved. And this is the message Paul says in verse 11 that he was appointed to preach. He has explained it and explained God's power in salvation to encourage Timothy not to fade in his faith, but be courageous. That power that saves the dead and makes them alive, the guilty and makes them innocent, that power, which is infinite power, was for him. And that message of salvation, of sovereign grace, is a message worth suffering for. Think of it. Christ has brought forgiveness and life, eternal life, to a fallen world. There's no greater message than that. That is why Paul said in Romans 1 verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the message of hope. It's the only message of hope to a world without hope. It's the promise of victory over death. Paul was privileged to be appointed to preach it. What's to be ashamed of? He was in chains for that message for preaching it, but he wasn't ashamed. He says that in verse 12, for this reason I also suffer these things, but I'm not ashamed. And for that reason he could tell Timothy to be courageous and join him in suffering for the gospel, for that great message. It's the, the greatest privilege there is on earth to preach the gospel. You have that privilege. It's not just a man who stands in a pulpit that's privileged. Every one of God's people are priests and saints and have that privilege to preach this gospel. It is a great privilege and it is a great honor, the greatest honor to suffer for Christ and for that message. But Paul didn't look at his imprisonment with regrets or look to the future with doubts. He was confident. And in the next statement, he explained why. For I know whom I have believed. He knew Jesus Christ. Now, notice Paul didn't say, I know what I have believed, but I know whom I have believed. Of course, it would have been correct to say, I know what I believed, and certainly Paul did know what he had believed, and that's necessary. It's very important to understand the gospel clearly, to understand the whole range of God's doctrine, to have a precise, clear understanding of it. We need to be accurate in our thinking, but it's not enough to know what the Bible teaches about Christ. We must know Him. We must believe in Him. We must enter into a personal relationship with Him through faith. Paul had done that. He knew the Lord personally, walked with Him daily, and knew from experience that the Lord was reliable 
and would never desert him, never disappoint him. And so he says, I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. Literally, what I have tr entrusted is my deposit, like uh, the deposit we would make in a bank. And it's the same word that was used back in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 20, which we studied not too long ago. Paul wrote, O oh, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. So Paul's deposit is what God deposited with him or entrusted to him. And that is the ministry. And Paul then has entrusted that to the Lord. It was his responsibility. But he's confident that the Lord would keep it safe. Even though Paul was in chains and would soon be gone, the ministry would not be lost. The cause would not end. Christ would keep it. That's the encouragement Paul was giving to Timothy and all ministers and all Christians. Whatever the attacks or misfortunes, God will preserve the faith. And he will do that to the end until that day, Paul says, which is the great day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ where Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, we will each be recompensed for our deeds. We will be rewarded for our faithful service. Now again, that's great encouragement. Paul was telling Timothy, this work cannot fail. God guarantees that. He is sovereign over the gospel and sovereign over the church just as he is sovereign over the universe. They were living in dark times. The church was persecuted and in retreat. False teaching was spreading. The enemy was making gains and the gospel seemed on the verge of extinction. But Paul was not in despair. He was confident because he knew that it was God's work and he would not allow it to fail. It will stand for eternity. It is invincible. God's gospel and kingdom will triumph. So the world could put Paul in chains, call him a fool for devoting his life to the service of Christ and the gospel, but Paul was not ashamed of himself or of his master or of his message. And Paul didn't want Timothy to be ashamed, so he uh, assured him that Christ's faithfulness in our work is the firm ground of confidence. I know him, Paul is saying. He is able. He is faithful. And then Paul turns to the instruction he began in verse 6 where he told Timothy to kindle afresh the gift that had been given to him. In other words, do the ministry. In verses 13 and 14, he 14, he tells him how to do it. He was to follow Paul's example. He was to guard the gospel. Verse 13, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me. Paul had given a standard of teaching and it was a model for all to follow. Like an architect draws up plans for a building in order to build correctly, the builder must follow those plans. And Paul's instruction is the blueprint for the church, not, not just a suggestion. What he taught is what we are to teach. Paul's doctrine and practice are universal for the church. He called it the standard of sound words. Sound words are wholesome words, uh, healthy words. We've seen that in 1 Timothy as well. These words and doctrines that give spiritual health to us are sound, they are healthy, and they are that in opposition to the words of the false teachers, the heretics, which weaken and destroy the faith. This word is used in Luke's gospel of people who are healthy or who have been healed by the Lord and given health. They are physically well, they're whole. And 
Paul's standard is, is sound because it is God's revelation, not man's speculation. And so it gives wholeness to us. It gives us spiritual health and strength. That's, that's Scripture, all of Scripture. And that is God's chief means of sanctifying us, conforming us to the image of Christ. And it's our standard and authority. That's Paul's meaning here. His standard encompasses the whole range of doctrine. He didn't pick and choose what he taught. He taught it all because it's all good, it's all healthy. We need it all. When he said goodbye to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, he reminded them that he did not shrink from declaring to them the whole purpose of God. Now, Paul knew human nature and knew it well, and he knew that even among the born again, there is a fear of doing that, of preaching the whole counsel of God and being embarrassed by the doctrines that are not particularly popular, some that are hard to accept. And so he knew some had a tendency to shrink from it. He didn't shrink from teaching them. Be not ashamed is what Paul would say to Timothy and what he'd say to us. He, he resisted that temptation if there had been a temptation to sort of trim his sails and avoid certain doctrinal issues. Now he could say to the Ephesian elders because he taught the whole purpose of God, I am innocent of the blood of all men. And here, for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the church, Timothy was to keep Paul's standard and follow it, not verge away from it. Do what Paul did. Teach what he taught. And, and teach it in the way Paul taught it. As he says, in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So Paul was not only concerned about what Timothy taught, but how Timothy taught. Orthodoxy is not cold. We often hear about the cold orthodoxy and get the idea, well, orthodoxy is something that's bad, it's cold. No, orthodoxy is straight opinion. It's correct opinion. It's right doctrine. That's what we need. And if we really understand the doctrines of the faith, if we understand the truth, then it will have a hold on us. It will change us. It will, it, and our knowledge of it will be characterized not by, only by faith, but also by love. Those virtues are the product of our union with Christ and, and are to be seen in our lives. Impatience with those who resist the truth is, I think, a, a, probably a common human nature, maybe as common as uh, fear of laughter and ridicule is. But impatience or anger doesn't advance the truth. So we have to resist that. Resist a kind of frustration with people and anger with people as we resist fear. And really, if we understand the truth, if we understand what Paul has said here about the gospel, then we know that faith is a gift. We're not going to open a person's heart with harsh words. Only the Holy Spirit can do that, and He will do that through faithful teaching, through faithful preaching, through the gospel. So we're to speak and teach knowing that it will only happen by God's grace and that apart from that grace, we would be no different from the world. We'd be just as belligerent toward the truth as the world is. But having the truth, we are to hold firmly to that truth in faith and with love, even if we're the only ones that hold to it, even if we have to stand alone doing that. And that's what Paul says next in verse 14 when he tells Timothy, and us, to guard the truth. Don't be belligerent, but don't be weak either. Never compromise with error. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. The treasure is the deposit of verse 12 and what was entrusted to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Same word. Here it is literally the good or beautiful deposit, the treasure 
That's what God entrusted to Timothy and the church for wise investment. It is a treasure and it is something beautiful because it is the message of life and immortality. So Timothy was to guard it. There are people who who want to rob the church of that treasure. They want to replace it with unsound, unhealthy doctrine. That is a challenge because the enemy is strong and the enemy is crafty. But again, the, the encouragement is we don't do that in our own strength. We do it through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, Paul says. So he keeps coming back to the Spirit of God and and God and His power. As the Spirit gives us that power of God, which he mentions at the end of verse 8. This is supernatural. I say that quite frequently, I know, but that's the Christian life. It's not a normal, natural life. It is a supernatural life. The battle that, I, that Paul is describing here is not our battle. It is his battle. We are to guard the truth. We are to guard the gospel. But we can do that with confidence, with courage, knowing that God is guarding it and guarding us with infinite power. And he honors our faith and vigilance. Understanding that, understanding the... the greatness of our salvation, the vital importance of the message we've been given should give us gratitude that we possess it and boldness to proclaim it. In fact, it should make us ashamed of ever being ashamed of the gospel or being afraid of the world's laughter. And we all be like uh, Alexamenos and boldly worship the Savior that the world mocks. Or like Christian and faithful. One of the best known passages in Pilgrim's Progress is when the two come to Vanity Fair. Bunyan's picture of the world with all the vain things that it it offers. When they came, Bunyan said, the fair was in a hubbub about them. First, they were dressed oddly. It was a picture of justification. They're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. It sets them apart. And the people stared at them and called them fools and madmen. And then they they talk strangely, probably a reference to sanctification. The change has taken place in their mind and their behavior. People couldn't understand what they said. It seemed to the men of the fair that they were barbarians. But also they had no interest in what the merchants were selling. Christian and faithful looked away and said, we buy truth. Well, that caused the men of the fair to despise them. So they put the two in a cage, and Bunyan said, made them objects of any man's sport or malice. The great man of the fair, the one in charge of it, laughed at them and everything that happened. But the pilgrims answered the ridicule and laughter by being patient Bunyan said, not rendering, railing for railing, but blessing and giving good words for bad and kindness for injuries. When they wouldn't yield, they scourged, faithful, stabbed him and burned him at the stake because he was faithful. It's it's an allegory, but it's true of many. And God give us the grace to do that, to suffer faithfully wherever we are, at home, at work, for the cross, to be not ashamed, but be bold and be clear. Now that's the word for the believer. The message for the unbeliever is, if you're here, believe. It's that simple. You're lost. Be found, be saved. Christ is the Savior, trust in Him. Be justified, be sanctified. Become a part of God's family. You have nothing to lose but your guilt and everything to gain. Forgiveness and life everlasting. May God help you to do that. And you who have, you who have believed, serve the Lord. May God help us all to do that and do it with boldness. We have a great God and a great salvation.
Let's end with hymn number 48 in the Songs of Praise book. Oh, the love of my Redeemer. And then uh, stand to sing and then remain standing for the benediction. Hymn number 48. Father, may we never cease to praise our Redeemer. Thank you for washing our sins away. Thank you for eternal life. Thank you for enabling us to receive and believe the greatest message of hope there is. Thank you for that hope in Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.